large spherical planet, turning on its axis as it moves through space. To observe all parts of the Earth at one time is impossible. Moreover, when we view the globe from any given angle and transfer the impression from this view to a two-dimensional flat map, Distortion enters in, particularly about the edges. This may lead to wrong impressions. There can be no perfect two-dimensional representation of a spherical three-dimensional surface. The closer the observer is to the globe, the less curvature enters into the picture, so there is less distortion. At extremely close range, distortion is negligible. A flat map of such a region is fairly accurate. Maps are two-dimensional charts, each made for a certain purpose in studying an area. Since only a small part of the globe was known to man in the days of Homer, his world map was satisfactory in his time. People then thought of the Earth as a giant flat object with its center at a point where Athens now stands and the Mediterranean, its great sea. There was thought to be a fringe of mountains bordering the land and a great ocean river all about its edge. In popular thinking, this was the kind of world well up to the 15th century, even though exploration by sailing ships from Western and Southern Europe had enlarged it considerably. Venice and Genoa were centers of sea commerce with Alexandria and other cities about the Mediterranean and trade with Germany, Flanders, and what is today France. Long before this, however, some scholars had been sure the Earth was a sphere. A globe like this was made in 1492 by Beheim in Germany from the same information which had spurred Columbus onward. When Columbus, Vasco da Gama, and others traveled more widely, the known world grew. New maps were needed to record their findings. Magellan clinched the matter of the Earth's roundness when his ship sailed completely around it. Flat maps were then made from Beheim's globe and others. Since there are no natural lines on the globe for purposes of measurement, an arbitrary space division is necessary. The spinning motion of the Earth establishes an axis of rotation, the points at the end being called the North Pole and the South Pole. If a plane is passed through the Earth, perpendicular to this axis and halfway between the poles, the circle is formed on the surface which establishes a starting point for measuring distances north and south. This is called the equator. Then if another plane is passed through the poles, a second circle called prime meridian is formed on the surface, a base for establishing east-west relations. Lines drawn parallel to the equator give distances north and south in degrees. East and west of the prime meridian, other meridian lines drawn from pole to pole give east-west distances in degrees. Thus, any point on the surface can be located by degrees north or south of the equator and east or west of the prime meridian. Mercator in 1538 striving to map the spherical Earth on a flat surface, wrapped a cylindrical paper about a globe. He projected latitude lines in this manner and longitude lines thus. He attained an accuracy as to location by degrees, but distances were distorted progressively toward the poles. This is because degrees of longitude, east-west measurements, become smaller in terms of miles as we go nearer the poles until at the North Pole, for example, all directions are to the south. Mercator's projection, moreover, exaggerates both latitude and longitude progressively toward the North and South Poles, as indicated by the arrows here east of Greenland. This often leads to misconceptions in popular thinking. A man's head, shown on Mercator's projection, looks like this. Hence, on Mercator's projection, Greenland must be drawn far larger than the continental United States. Within it, in black, is shown here its actual relative size, and here the correct size. Naturally, 
This projection also distorts distances in high latitudes. Thus, Rome appears to be much closer to New York than from New York to the mouth of the Lena River. On the globe, we see the distances actually are the same. Again, on the Mercator projection, a straight line course plotted from the Panama Canal to Tokyo appears to pass through the Hawaiian Islands. Let's find the shortest distance. It passes east of Salt Lake City and through the Aleutian Islands of Alaska, missing Hawaii by 2,000 miles. How such a straight course would appear on a Mercator projection is shown by this broken line arc. Here is another attempt to depict the globe. All the world on one half an equatorially bloated ball. It gives an accurate picture of size, but a tremendous distortion of shape, just as we show all sides of a man's head in one picture in this way. Then there is the orange peel map. In the attempt to avoid distortion in relative distances, we get this result, accurate as to land areas, but difficult when it comes to showing ocean distances. Or if the oceans are kept whole, the continents must be broken and land distances and relations become vague. We still think of the Earth as consisting of an eastern hemisphere and a western hemisphere. This was all very well in the days of sailing vessels when navigators were interested in maps that showed prevailing winds. When ships came to use steam power, Another kind of global thinking became necessary, for then a ship could take the shortest distance between a port of departure and one of entry. Such a direct route is called a great circle route. It is the arc made on the Earth's surface by a plane passing through the two ports and the Earth's center. Since there is relatively little land south of the equator, Today's world interests are chiefly in the Northern Hemisphere, which contains most of the land and land resources. Therefore, today's global thinking depends increasingly upon a map centered roughly on the North Pole. Travel and transportation are largely between the Earth's great centers of industry and population, the continental United States, Europe, Eastern Asia, and Southern Asia. On such a map, the areas which are most distorted are in the southern hemisphere. Furthermore, the airplane has come onto the world scene. Its great speed makes the Earth shrink in time and space. The airplane forces us to think in terms of great circle routes. We see that the northeast corner of Alaska is closer to Berlin than is New York City. Seattle on the Pacific coast is about as close to Berlin as is Miami. Again, how much more directly products and people can be transported by air between London and Seattle than by ship and rail between London and Seattle? From New York, airmail is delivered in Juneau, Alaska in a few hours. It is a little more than half as far by air from London to Suez as by the shortest water route, and how much faster. With the amazing air developments of today, jetliners can reach out from each of the centers of industry, population, and resources, and can maintain contact with the rest of the world constantly. The 6,000 mile radius from Tokyo includes all of Asia, most of Europe, and most of North America. A similar radius from Central Europe includes practically all of Africa, all of North America, South America to the Amazon Basin, and Asia except the East Indies. The 6,000 mile air radius from Chicago includes all of Europe, part of Africa, almost the whole of South America, the northern half of Asia, and part of Japan. From the centers, the outer limits of each of these areas can be reached by air within hours. Thus, we can see that our thinking of today must emerge from earthbound concepts of the past. Aircraft and spacecraft are forcing us to think of transportation along great circle air routes 
which run independent of land and water. And as we enter the space age, even newer concepts of time and space are emerging which will give a new perspective of our Earth. 